welcome to another episode for Layman of the Apocalypse. A show where ordinary friends have slightly irreverent conversations about theology, church, and the Christian life in a world where the sky is always falling. Hey guys, welcome back to the Layman of the Apocalypse podcast. We're grateful that you're able to join us today. And we have a special guest, Tolian Chavijan. He's the pastor of the Sanctuary down in Jupiter, Florida. And this is a guy who understands what it's like to crash and to burn, go through the flames, smelling like smoke, but get up and continue to follow Jesus. And that's why we love this guy. And I hope that you enjoy this episode as much as we did. Without further ado, here's Tolian. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Jingle, jingle, jingle. Hey, how's it going, Tolian? What up? <laughs> Sorry, I'm a few minutes late. I was untangling my headphones. <laughs> no, you're good. We appreciate you taking the time. Yeah, you sound good. Thanks for joining. Yeah, you guys are welcome. Where Where are you guys, like, geographically? Well, I'm actually, uh, Matt uh, Johnson and myself are actually located in uh, Florida, and Matt Casarilla is all the way across in California. Ah, yes, okay. All right. What part of Florida? Uh, Citrus County, actually. Citrus County, so Orlando. Is that right? Uh, maybe a little bit north northwest of Orlando by about an hour. So, um, do you know uh, Ray Cortez? Yes, I know him very well. Yeah, he's our pastor. Oh, nice. Okay, good. Yeah, Ray. Uh, I mean, I haven't seen him in five years. But, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but he. Uh, yeah, he's. I think he spoke at the last Liberate conference we had, or mm-hmm. I don't remember if it was mm-hmm. 2014 or 2015, but he spoke at a men's retreat for us the year before, and his messages were so amazing. I said, I want you to deliver that same exact message at Liberate next year if you'd be willing to do it. And he did. We were honored to have him. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's, there's a handful of people that smell a lot like Jesus and really get the gospel and and yourself and, and Ray and, and, you know, Steve Brown and a lot of these guys who've just really just figured out the gospel in a way that they, they, they you step out of piety and you're like, you know what, we, we need to just preach this un, yeah, unadulterated, unfettered. like, yeah, unfettered, yeah. Un, uncut. Yep. <laughs> yep, that's exactly right. And it's beautiful. It's beautiful. I find myself constantly coming back to your sermons and being like, you know what, I, I, I just, I appreciate all the teaching I'm getting here and over here. And I'm just like, you know, today I just, I need, I need the gospel raw. And I know yeah, I, no matter what, I can come to your sermons and there's, there's something there in every sermon and it's always about Jesus. And it's always about how he's big, we're small, Jesus mm. plus nothing equals everything. And and it just... That, that would be an amazing title for a book. You wouldn't just gave it? me a great idea. Yeah. Hey, man. Hey, man. You know, <laughs> royalties here. I expect them. Yes. Thank you. I will, I will give you a finder's fee for the title. <laughs> okay. I appreciate that. <laughs> Speaking of finder's fees, uh, this is Matt Johnson over here, by the way, Tolian. Totally. Thank you yeah. again for coming on the show. Um, yeah, you're welcome. Just like Brian said, uh, been following your ministry for quite a while, uh, even back in the EPC days. Um, wow. Yeah, That's going man. way back. And uh, it was funny that we had a small PCA church here, a small church plant um, here on the Nature Coast, and we totally ripped off your uh, title from your book, <laughs> Jesus Plus Nothing Equals Everything. We literally <laughs> printed that on our building. Put grace to the test. <laughs> so, there you go. Listen, but, uh, I, uh, that, there's no, there, we don't make any money, so there's you know, no bother going after us. <laughs> yeah, no, don't worry about it. Uh, the gospel is God's great public domain, so we may all come up with our various ways of, you know, describing it, articulating it, but we're all just saying the same thing, those of us who are saying it. So yeah. there is no claim, no claim. Amen, man. That's all. <laughs> well, we, we just started this podcast not that long ago, but really just based off of like what Brian said, some some great teaching that we've learned over the years. Um, you know, Brian and I are, you know, pretty much... Westminster Confession card holders. Uh, we go to the PCA <laughs> church with you know Pastor Ray Cortez, but uh, our friend Matt is kind of a free spirited like 
charismatic Calvinist. That, I help uh, get California. people saved so they can be pastors in your <laughs> denomination. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Yeah, we need we we need that we need the charismatic. We need them all. Yeah. Yeah. It, so. Whenever we're, when, we're, when things really go south in life and you need prayer, they're the ones you go to. Period. I'm gonna pull a switcheroo on you guys. Karis, <laughs> Grace, yeah. Matic. I'm a Grace fanatic. There you go, man. You, <laughs> you dude, you keep saying that. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. So what are you up to these days? Are you talking to me? What am I? So, okay, well, real quick before, because I wanna, I don't want to get ahead of you guys or myself. Let me know. Are we recording right now? We are. Correct, oh, sir. okay. Are you, so are you guys gonna edit like all of this stuff and just yeah. keep it as is? We, 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 we trim it. Brian trims it down. He, he cooks a mean steak. So. <laughs> okay. Good. Good. We can even um, bounce it off you to make sure you're okay with it, man. Because we're not. Yeah, to, it. I trust you guys. We're no, not I trust you guys. Doing this or exploiting this, we're just saying thank you. No, dude, you guys. You guys are you guys are welcome um and i'm i am glad to be on i got uh i got your note uh brian i got your note and <clears throat> uh went back my wife was sitting in the room and went back and listened to the podcast where you guys said you mentioned something about me so i'm always mm-hmm. curious i'm like well that could mean they mentioned something and it was positive or they mentioned something <laughs> and it was negative so <laughs> Let me go check it out. Um, Sweet. And and, uh, we both listened to it. My wife is an amazing, amazing woman who is a fierce protector of mine. So we listened to it and I said, I really like these guys. And she said, I do too. So that's when I responded and said, absolutely, I'd be honored to do it. So I'm happy to be on and I'm grateful for the invitation. And uh, I'm glad this time worked for all of us. So in terms of what am I doing now? Well, uh, about a year ago, in fact, right at a year ago, my wife and I moved from the southwest coast of Florida in Fort Myers, where we had been living for a year and a half back to the southeast coast of Florida uh, in Jupiter, just north of West Palm Beach, which is about 45 minutes north of Fort Lauderdale, where I'm from. There was a group of people who contacted us in November of 2018 and asked if we would consider the possibility of planting a church, Mm -hmm. which was not immediately attractive to me at all, at all. (laughs) Uh, For about a year and a half leading up to that point, uh, we were traveling almost every weekend. I was traveling and speaking, and I am not an itinerant preacher. Like, I am so much of a homebody, and I have a very strict kind of daily boring routine. I eat the same stuff every day at the same time. I work out at the same time every day. Like, I'm just a yeah, yeah well, I'm just a homebody. <laughs> I really am. I mean, I'm just a homebody, and I've been that way for a long time. I travel when I have to, but I didn't want my the rest of my life to be spent on the road. You know, at yeah. home Monday, yeah. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, leave Friday, come back Sunday. So, so when we were actually on a layover in the Dallas airport on our way to Austin, Texas, and we get a call from a girl who has known me since I was in eighth grade. Her family and my family have been friends, and her and my my wife had become friends and so she calls my wife and she says would you two ever be interested in coming to Jupiter and starting a church hmm. so that kind of took us off guard a little bit that was not really what i was thinking i would do at all and yeah. make a very long story short we had a number of conversations my wife and i made a couple of trips over from Fort Myers to Jupiter and spent the weekend with some of these people. And um, and after about, oh, I don't know, two or three months of a lot of prayer, a lot of counsel, really going to the people. First, our church. Uh, we were members of a Lutheran church in Fort Myers and uh, so went to you know our pastor, who's a dear friend and uh, a real pastor to us and our elders and said, this has come up and we need you guys to weigh in on this and went to uh, my mentor and spiritual father, Paul Zoll. He and his wife, Mary, have been huge for Stacy and me. I mean, they have walked with us through the valley of the shadow of death thousands of times. And so we went to them and said, what do you think? And uh, consulted with a few other people that really know us well, that we look up to and uh, listen to. And 
So to make a long story short, after uh, months of that, we concluded that this is in fact what God wanted us to do. My wife came to that conclusion a little bit before I did. <laughs> uh, and she <laughs> was very patient. <laughs> yeah, and she was very patient. Uh, and I told her she's, she's born and raised in Texas. She is a Texas girl through Sweet. and through. Her entire family's in Texas. Uh, she has a large extended family. She is the only one who lives outside of Texas. Um, and so- So uh, she's a woman's woman, right? Right there, man. <laughs> she's a woman's woman. She is. She's an amazing woman. And so, but she's never been a pastor's wife. Mm. And so I said, listen, your excitement over this is a, is a bit naive. <laughs> never underestimate a Texan, man. Never right. underestimate him. I was like, honey, I love your passion for this and I love your enthusiasm mm -hmm. for this. But at the same time, I've been there, I've done that, and I have zero intentions of going back. Yeah. And I just, you know, I mean, everything that blew up in 2015, I was just, just the thought of being a pastor gave me PTSD. It mm -hmm. really did. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I was not, you know, I wanted to serve people and love people in whatever way God allowed me to do that. But I never saw myself pastoring a church again. And I certainly didn't see myself planting a church. Yeah. So, um, so it took a lot of uh, convincing uh, on God's part to get me to the point where I really, <laughs> where I really I, I understand saw that. Is, <laughs> oh man, I mean, it took, you know, it, and, and the people that we were going to and seeking counsel from were uh, uniformed in their counsel. I mean, they were all, there was not an ounce of hesitation, which meant a lot to me because I really listened to these people and depend on these people. And if they would have said, if one of them would have said, bad idea, don't do it, we wouldn't have done it. Uh, and it was a wide fact, variety of uh, an audience for you to sort of bounce your ideas off of. And, and, it was. And yeah, I mean, it was a small circle. I mean, the people that really have invested a lot of pain and blood and sweat and tears mm -hmm. uh, into me specifically and to my wife and I uh, as a couple, I mean, those are the people who have proven that they're going to be non-blinking friends come yeah. hell or high water. And yeah. so what they said uh, matters. I mean, it mattered a lot and what they continue to say matters a lot. But so mm -hmm. when they were all in agreement that this is, I think what God's calling you to do, I was scared. I was nervous. My wife, if she were here, she would tell you that I would wake up almost every morning and say, I don't want to do this. Like, I just don't <laughs> want to do this. That's um, how you know I it's mean, God right there, man. <laughs> I, I know he's such a sadomasochist. Uh, so, <laughs> It's like, okay, I know that if I really don't want to do it, it's probably what God wants me to do. But I mean, I would, there were, there were certain things that were attractive to me about it. One was that I desperately wanted to get back to the Southeast coast of Florida. I mean, it's my home, even though I've never lived in Jupiter before and it's 45 minutes North of where I grew up. It's Paradise, still the Southeast man. coast of Florida. Man, yeah. it's beautiful. Yeah. Uh, I have, I have three kids. My oldest son is 25, my middle son is 23, my daughter's 18, and they all live in Fort Lauderdale. So I wanted to be, you know, closer to them. We're very close, and I wanted to be geographically close to them. And so that was attractive. Getting off the road and not having to travel was very attractive. Mm -hmm. But if I could have had those two things without planting a church, I would have <laughs> opted for that. <laughs> Uh, well, God so, does use our desires to lead us. I know, I know. So, and you, um, and you have a new covenant heart, so it's legit. Well, <laughs> thank you. Um, so we moved here a year ago, and we began laying the foundation for this church, which we called the Sanctuary, mm -hmm. and really started to envision what it would be and uh, what kind of a community we wanted to have. I told my wife early in the process, I, I'm, I'm willing to go if we have the freedom to create the kind of church that would joyfully welcome people like us. Yeah. People who have a story to tell, people who have failed miserably, people who have crashed and burned and bottomed out. If we can create a space for people like that to feel comfortable and That's to most come. people. 
<laughs> yeah, I know. It's all people. Yeah. It's yeah. Just, you know, it's, I've said this many times, but when Jesus says, you know, I haven't come for the righteous, I've come for the sinner, he's not saying there are good people in this world who don't yeah. need me and there are bad people who do. What he's saying is there are bad people who there are there are bad people who think that they're good and there are bad people who know that they're bad. Yeah, and so absolutely. you know, we are all those kinds of people and uh, and so we the gospel came, is the nuclear football. It I mean, is. And yeah. God's given it to you. And he's like, just run down the field, son. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. I know. And he's like, no, just go through the line packers. Go through the defensive ends. I'm like, okay, it's getting a little old. Where are my blockers? Where are my blockers? <laughs> You're like, this Pharaoh's <laughs> army. What are you talking about? Yeah, right. It's like, it would be, I'll, I'll do whatever you want, God. Just give me an offensive line, please, yes. to, to create some holes. Um, but so we, we spent the summer months last Last summer, uh, meeting with these people on a weekly basis, laying the foundation, and we officially launched our church in September, middle of September last year. And uh, we have been slowly building and enjoying the process. I, this this time around is so different for me in so many different ways. I mean, first of all, it's been five years since I was a pastor. and. Mm -hmm. In those five years, I lived the equivalent of 50 years, at least it feels that way. Okay. And so, you know, I mean, God just put me to death in so many different ways. He put me to death in almost every way during that time. And it was incredibly painful and it was miserable. And I never want to go through something like that again. But I am as a result of God's killing work. It's like Jonah uh, praying in the belly of the whale. You know, he's just like, yeah. This yeah. sucks, but I trust yeah. you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and I mean, I had a hard time trusting God at some point, just going, okay, I don't, like, what are you doing? I feel like I've learned enough. You know, you, you <laughs> your bot the bottom falls out in your life, and you think you've hit rock bottom, and just when you're about to get back on your feet, another bottom falls out, and then mm -hmm. another bottom falls out, and you're like, is that was You're walking you know, on water, experience. dude. <laughs> walking yeah, on water. right. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's the it way is. it felt, and so, um, and so we uh, we launched officially in September, and we have been uh, enjoying. It hasn't been without its challenges, just like any church work, but we yeah. have thoroughly enjoyed the process. I feel ten times different this time around. Thank um, you for doing for, this, for, by the way. Like oh, gosh, start, man. For for like doing it after you you fell in the drink because like Peter walked on water twice and a lot of people forget that. Right. But, yeah, but he got right. he got he got out of the boat and yeah. and and you and you've done that in your life. So I just want to say thank you, man. Like oh man. Well, I, I mean, I wish I, I appreciate you saying that. I wish I could take some credit for it. I oh, it's the grace of me. God, no doubt. But like yeah. you're, feel, you're feeling it, so I'm just like, hey, thanks for being positive. About it at least. Oh like. gosh, man! No, yeah, right. No, you're you welcome, know. man. I mean, I I'm telling you, and this is the God to honest truth, man. I am alive and doing what I'm doing today, not because in my darkest moments, in my weakest moments, I held on to God. I mean, I let go ten thousand times. Mm -hmm. I'm here today and doing what I'm doing because in my darkest, weakest moments, God never let go of me, and that is just a fact. When people yes. ask me. How did you get from where you were to where you are? And honestly, and this is not a joke, I honestly say I have no earthly idea. I wish, <laughs> I mean, I wish that I could yeah. give you some formula on how to pick yourself up by your bootstraps once you crash and burn. I don't have that formula. I just know that God carried me from where I was to where I am and oftentimes he was doing it while I was kicking and screaming. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, I'm just super, super grateful for his grace. It's super real. It's not theoretical. Yeah. It's not simply yeah, intended to be discussed and debated. I mean, it is a life. It's lifeline. a real deal, man. It Here's is a, a Matt lifeline. Cassarella quote. The only way to Jesus is through the haunted house, man. And, <laughs> yep. Yeah. And, 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 and but guess what? You can't hang out with Jesus without being lit on fire. So. <laughs> right. right. Yeah. So you, you can learn to enjoy it or, or complain the whole way, right? I do. That I I totally agree, man. <laughs> so we um, so we've been. I think the other thing that feels very different this time around is I 
I know who I am mm-hmm. better now than I ever did previously. And so, you know, I didn't realize until I had squandered everything that mm-hmm. I had located my identity in so many different mm-hmm. things. And there was more grace. The there was more yes, grace. Yes, <laughs> there was. There was. There yeah. was. Never ending. Yeah. Never ending. But I, wow. you know, I and I talk about this often, but, you know, I had so located my worth, my value, my significance, my security, my identity, really. In, you grew up in the camera's um, eye, man. Like, there's just- well, and it was, and it was, it was beyond that. It was, it was just my own success as a messenger of the gospel mm-hmm. took center stage over mm-hmm. the gospel itself. Ooh, and, gotcha. and, and I only know that by looking back. Yeah. It didn't feel that way when I was oh, going course. through it. Until you touched um, the ark. <laughs> like, right. Oh. <laughs> right, right. Whoops. Yeah, whoops. Yeah, <laughs> shouldn't have done that. Uh, but, I mean, so I think now, this time around, and God just systematically deconstructed me. So um, I don't care. I really don't give a rat's ass if this church has a hundred people or a thousand people in it. I don't care. I don't care if I write another book. I don't care about public opinion. And all of that is so liberating. It's almost like, man, I didn't realize I didn't realize until I lost it that I had come to depend on those things to make me feel like I mattered. And so, you know, uh, uh, God yeah. just had to strip me, strip me, strip me. You know, I mean, I just, I, I, it's oftentimes you don't realize what you're depending on to make life worth living until you lose those things. Mm-hmm. And then those things are exposed. And those were certainly exposed to me. And so I am incredibly grateful for the pastors and counselors who walked with me and dealt with me during the worst season of my life. My good friend Paul Zoll said when I was at my worst and literally ready to throw in the towel, uh, he said to me, the suffering you are experiencing is God kicking you into a new freedom from false definitions of who you are. Mm-hmm. And he really put his finger on what was actually going on with me, which was a bona fide identity crisis. Yeah, I didn't no. know who I was without these things and without these people and without these opportunities and, mm-hmm. you know, all of that stuff. And I mean, I, you know, my, my marriage fell apart. My home was broken. My job was gone. My opportunities were gone. My credibility was gone. Everything that I had come to depend on that was smaller than Jesus was literally evaporated almost overnight. And so, uh, you know, that pushed me into a massive identity crisis when I was 41 years old. And uh, it took a solid four to five years uh, in order for me to come out on the other side and go, man, ministry seems so much more freeing now because Number one, I feel what sufferers are feeling and sinners are feeling in a way that I didn't. You hugged the cactus, man. Yes, <laughs> hugged the cactus. Yes. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, and my wife, who's just so wise and so amazingly grounded and mature, she said, you know, I listened to so many of your sermons and read your books before I knew you. And she said, your ministry was always very sympathetic to the sufferer and to the sinner. Yes, and yeah. she said, but now, she said, now I listen to you and I read what you write and I hear what you say and I listen to the way you talk to people. And she said, you have something now that is deeper than what you had before. Street you have, cred, man. Street well, cred. Well, she, she does say <laughs> that, but she, she says, she has said that, but she said you, in your voice and coming from your heart, yeah, I hear yeah. an empathy and yeah. empathy. And For she sure. said, you know, I mean, it's a good distinction. The distinction between sympathy and empathy is a good one. Uh, yeah. Sympathy is I hear what you're saying. Empathy yeah. is I feel what you're feeling. Yeah. Yeah. And, and um, here's some crazy, like borderline musings of, of, a, of a heretic for me is we always talk about Jesus becoming sin, you know, mm. and, and the reality is, is like he became sin in every way. So like all the psychosis, all the anxiety, all the struggles that come with that identity, like, and what kind of launched me into this thinking was where Paul was talking about sin and saying that, you know, account yourselves, you know, to be alive unto God. 
And I'm thinking being dead to sin isn't just like this concept of forgiveness. It's like, I don't feel the guilt anymore. I don't feel the shame anymore. I don't feel the anxiety anymore. Like yeah, God, Jesus, well Jesus died for that too. He didn't just yes. die like, all right, hurry up, get it over with. Wham, bam, thank you, ma'am. You know, like, like yeah. he came sin on the cross. Not to cut you off and, because you're on fire, bro, and I want what you got. So keep sinning. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, listen, no, I mean, that's very, very well said. And I, I was just thinking about this. I was talking to a friend of mine. And I said, the gospel is so much more scandalous than what we, what we think it is. I mean, it is so scandalous that it, it's almost Robert Capon calls the gospel immoral. From it's our illegal on this world. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. It is, it's immoral and it's illegal from our vantage point. Yes. And so, um, but it's so much more scandalous. And I said, you know, I was just reading the passage where Paul says, you know, he who knew no sin became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. And I said, you know, growing up and hearing that, and even as a young preacher preaching that, you know, you sort of simplify that into a safe Jesus died for your sin. Yes, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. But it's so much more dangerous than that because it's not Jesus died for your sins. It's Jesus didn't just die for adulterers. Jesus died as an adulterer. He became one. Jesus, <laughs> yes. On he didn't cross. just die for murderers. He died as a murderer. Your actual and, sins. <laughs> yes. And he yeah. became that. And it almost sounds blasphemous to it say does. it. But, but unless you're bordering on what sounds like blasphemy, you're not even close to the gospel. You're not right, even man. close. Yeah. Yeah. The high priestly prayer of Jesus would be heretical, like by most standards. Yeah. You know, yeah. he's like, I want you to be one with the glory. I want you to be <laughs> one with the life. You're like, you're like, Jesus, are you on like TBN? What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> oh, right. You know? Yeah. Oh, right. Yeah. But it's yeah. high priest Jesus, you know? <laughs> right. That's right. That's right. So, it's, hey, you know, I mean, we're we're going, I mean, things are going well here. I mean, we've been quarantined for the last two and a half months, which if you're going to be quarantined, being quarantined in Jupiter, Florida, across the street from the beach is not a bad place. But, <laughs> yeah. um, but it was, I, was, I was telling some people who said, well, how's the church doing? You know, I mean, you were only six months old when, you know, you were forced to sort of shut things down. And I said, honestly, it came at the absolute perfect time because every time a new church a new organization in general, but a new church in particular starts, there's all this vigor and there's all this passion and there's this excitement that's new, it's novel. And once you hit the six month mark, a general malaise begins to set in because people are tired, the honeymoon is over, um, the novelty has worn off. And so this came at the absolute perfect time for not only my wife and me, but our church. It's given everybody a break. It's given everybody a breather. We've been forced to go online, which is not really my thing, but um, but it has been reaching thousands of people, which has been a complete shock to us, considering that none of us know anything about technology <laughs> and uh, are very bare bones. And so... Uh, we're the church is doing well. We're getting ready to move. In fact, we are in the process of moving into a permanent facility, which we're super excited about. So when we reopen, which hopefully will be in the beginning of July, uh, we will reopen in a permanent facility that we are now demoing and uh, outfitting for our needs as we speak. So uh, so things are things are going good, and we are operating completely outside the system. And when I say that, I don't mean that we are you know we're operating outside of any form of accountability. What I mean is I have lost complete trust in uh, the church as an institution in its current expression. And that's not, and that's, and I, that's just coming from a churchman, a guy who uh, believes that church is the gathering of God's people and it's Absolutely. not me and my buddy sitting at Starbucks. So <laughs> I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm not anti-church at no, all. No, no, no. Uh, but I, I, because I'm so transparently, uncomfortably transparent about 
my own story, I get hundreds, and I mean hundreds and hundreds of letters and notes from pastors, ex-pastors, um, people who are in the church, people who used to go to church, who tell me their own crash and burn stories and how their particular church handled it. And I'm telling you, man, the church is bad at handling real sinners, especially yeah. if that real sinner is in a leadership position and falls on their face. Let me They're just, you know. Can I share a crazy paradigm with you that I think will help you, but I'm just using that like graciously. So you got the apostolic succession of like Peter, right? And it's all about passing the baton. But then you got the apostolic succession of Paul and it's one born out of a due time, basically the bastard apostle. Mm, and what's right. unique about your story is like, you do have the pedigree and yet God gives you the audible. He gives you like that one born out of due time. Like, yeah, you could have fit into the whole just passing of the baton succession, hmm. but, but Jesus creates an audible. I mean, as is typical Jesus fashion, right? And, and, and I think that's awesome. I, I don't know, if, does that make sense or is that too muddled? I yeah, listen, that. no, it no, it makes so I absolutely feel like I am God's audible play. The one that no one prepared for, the, no, the one that no one planned on, the one yeah. that's thrown out there and when everyone least expects it. And I have felt that way. Like, God, what are you doing with me? I mean, I, I would love to figure out another way to live my life. In fact, one of the things that and we knew I was going to get hammered, my wife and I and our friends knew that when word got out that I was going to start a church, that I was going to get hammered yeah. um, from, you know, all of the basement bloggers. And I did. <laughs> I mean, I did. Yeah, of course. I got hammered yeah. for it. And of course. all of the old stuff got brought up, stuff that was true got brought up, stuff that is categorically false got brought up as if it was true. Um, yeah. And 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 yet, at the same time, I while we were going through that, um, and we were, you know, I could I, I had I had been off the grid for a while, and so things had died down, and I was be you know by God's grace, my wife and I were you know we were building our life together, and relationships were being mended and restored, and amends was being made, and all you know was being made all and you know behind the scenes and. Um, so you actually have to do the stuff that you would counsel and pastor people about. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So, uh, but so you know, I'm when when all of this came out, the the one of the narratives, one of the many narratives was this guy is jumping back into pastoral ministry because he just can't stand not being in the spotlight. Yeah. And my wife, my wife, who you know wants to rip her hair out of her head when she hears that <laughs> says she says uh okay first of all no one wants to be out of the spotlight more than my husband because pastors every, get beat up dude <laughs> right but, i mean she's just like every time he steps into the spotlight he gets a rock thrown in his face why yeah. in the world would he want it so yeah. she said you know if he would have gone this is her speaking now if he goes into any other industry i mean selling insurance selling homes building a business, starting a gym, whatever. No one cares. Yeah, no and cares. he goes on about his life and doesn't get attacked. The one industry where he knows he is going to get pummeled yeah. is the one that God calls him to. And so she made it, she's like, just logic and reason would tell you that that narrative is ridiculous, that he's yeah. just jonesing to get back into the it's spotlight. Like more I'm suffering, like, please. Yeah, right, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Yeah, that's why when she hears it, she's just like, what in the world? It's like, my God, do these people have a brain? Who would believe that? So yeah. um, anyway, but, uh, but we're, you know, bro. yeah, yeah, it's been, it's been it's been a wild ride, but we are excited to be on it. And um, and I, you know, we when I going back to what I said earlier about we're operating, you know, sort of outside of the system. I told my wife the other day, I said, there are company men and there are non-company men. Mm -hmm. And I've never been a company man. I mean, no, never. Yeah. I, didn't, I mean, I didn't come into this world a company man. And, and you worked for a company. That's the irony. Right. Like, yes. <laughs> Well so you're, said, you're, and that's the kind exactly of where I'm going. We we dream of of having those types of people that'll go against the grain, but most people are like, oh, you don't understand what I have to lose. 
you know? Well, it's exactly. And I, you know, and the, the truth of the matter is we were doing what we were, what, what we were saying uh, at Liberate through my books uh, and through Coral Ridge, all that kind of stuff. I mean, we were inside the company, but we were championing a non-company message. And, uh, and, and I would have never left that because there were too many comforts. Um, mm. I would have never, ever chosen to leave that. And, um, and I think in a sense, being cast out of the system and of that particular industry, I mean, sort of, you know, evangelical Christianity, that industry, yeah. Uh, yeah. has really given me the freedom to say, you know what, I just, I don't care what the company says. I'm not dependent on the company anymore. Yeah. The company doesn't want me. I don't want them. I am here for the people that would never darken the door of any of these companies. Yeah, man, that, that's exactly um, why we're here. Yeah. <laughs> Layman yeah. of the Apocalypse. That's the whole inspiration right. of this podcast is, yeah, is to kind much. of reach the bruised reeds of the church. Yes, yes. And there are many and one of the things we talk about at the sanctuary is we really want this place to be a place where the gospel is so championed and where the gospel is so tangible in its declaration and its delivery that it, the sanctuary is a place where you can tell the truth about yourself, the whole truth about yourself, without fear of rejection. And we named the church the sanctuary because as I was doing some historical research on sanctuaries and where the word came from and what used to be called sanctuaries, one, one of the things that stood out was the fact that, you know, sanctuaries were churches where guilty, convicted felons who knew they were guilty could run and escape the condemnation of the law. Yeah, we talked about that before the show. We were talking about there used to be a place for confession in the society and it doesn't exist anymore. Right, right. No, that's exactly right. And so if you remember um, that scene from Les Mis, whichever version you guys have watched. Oh, it's but, a great uh, story. Yeah. Oh, it's the best. But, you know, where Jean Valjean goes, he's running from the law, literally running from the law. And he, well, you know, makes his way to a convent. Uh, and, you know, he, he, he finds sanctuary there. Um, and when the law shows up, when Inspector Javert shows up with all of his cronies, the nun will not let them in, and mm. they don't have the legal right to even go in. Wow, that and is so, a prophetic picture right there. Dude, it's beautiful. I mean, <laughs> wow. and so it literally. I mean, the, I mean, literally, the the word sanctuary literally means a place of refuge and safety, and historically. Yeah. It's historically, anyway, churches were, ch churches were places where fugitives could seek at least temporary yeah. protection from the law. Yeah, a higher place than government. Yeah, right. And what's interesting about that, and what was wow. so captivating to me about it, was that every person who fled to a church for sanctuary knew that they were lawbreakers. They knew that they were guilty. That's oh, why absolutely. they were there. Yeah. yeah. It's like the people who ran to Jesus. <laughs> yes. And when you look yeah. at the church today, all too often, because of the moralistic message that is all too often delivered, um, what you get is a, a pack of people who begin to think that they are what is right with the world. Yeah. That we are what is right with the world and everyone out there is what is wrong with the world. And so if we don't recover this mm. sanctuary sense about yeah. church, which which only the law and the gospel can produce. Yeah, uh, the law shows us we aren't even close to making the grade. Yeah. Thank you for your consistency, man. We appreciate that. Oh, gosh, man. It's the only bullet in my gun. <laughs> yeah. That's a good thing. It is. Good bullet it to is. have. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because you're not compromising the message. And I just want to point that out to whoever's listening out there. This guy actually believes in the law of God. He just believes in the actual law of God. Yeah. Right. Not some cheap inversion of do more, try harder. Yeah. It is no. Be perfect as your father in heaven is perfect. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's the standard. I was preaching a series of sermons on the Ten Commandments years ago. I entitled the sermon series, How to Be Perfect. I started by saying, listen, if you're into to-do lists, this sermon series is for you, man. Yeah. I mean, if yeah. you're into checking off the boxes, this is for you. 
Um, and I said that facetiously, of course. But after about two or three weeks of being in the series, I was getting pushback from, you know, the blogosphere and the sort of yeah, the, the people out there. And they were suggesting that I was saying that the law, the Ten Commandments in particular, primarily exists to show us how far from keeping the Ten Commandments we actually are. Absolutely. Which is true. And they had a problem with that. And one of the questions that came up was, okay, I understand what you're saying, but once God saves us and regenerates us, and we now have the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit, are we not now capable of keeping God's law? That, that's a classic argument, yeah. Right. I keep tripping over Jesus. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> he gets in my way all the time. All the time. So I, I said, listen, that is a great question. And uh, it's interesting theologically, and it's interesting theoretically, and uh, it's a worthy conversation to have. Once I become a Christian because of God's amazing grace, and now I have His Holy Spirit living inside of me, do, don't I become capable of doing God's law? And I said, that's a great theological discussion to have, and that discussion has been had over the centuries. But here's the question I'm primarily concerned about, not the question, are you able to do it? My question is, are you doing it? <laughs> and if you're and if you're not, then just shut up and thank God for Jesus. That's yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like yeah. why why do we feel this intense uh, compulsion to just say, where is my part? Where it's is a my kid in the game? It's oh a my god. It's the same in, I was gonna say hey, Matt's I've been, been patient. I've been I'm listening. Sorry. I'll let you know, yeah, Matt. I've been patiently listening to this, just enjoying enjoying the conversation. We're both over here like fanboys right now, so For real. <laughs> Um, um, but this is the this thing. This dude's on fire, dude. I, I'm uh, loving it. Yeah, straight up. No, but seriously, I the one thing is you finally got to the the point where I really needed to ask my question. I'm going to be selfish for two minutes um, while my dog's coughing up along. Um, hang on one second. All right, there we go. Um, so seriously, um, this is where I'm struggling. Uh, I want to obey the law of God. Um, I want to become a better Christian and, uh, you know, I want to improve myself and, and, and yet I find that there is this really, uh, pervasive mentality out there in the church where we just are so focused on our sin all the time. And it feels like, and I was talking to these guys before, you know, the, the call, it feels like. God is more concerned about us loving our neighbor and, you know, actually doing mercy and justice than he is about the little things that we're always focused on as evangelical Christians. And don't you think that that is a big part of the problem, why, why the church is no longer the sanctuary that it, that it used to be or it should be? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the conversation regarding well, you 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 asked a loaded question. There's so much in what you asked, which is all good. It's a great question. Um, the first thing I I will address before I answer that question is I'm not sure I understand. I, I understand what you mean, but I I almost think it's dangerous language. The language that all of us grew up with, I'm assuming all of us grew up with this kind of language, the language of becoming a better Christian. I don't even know what the hell that means. I mean, honestly, <laughs> Thank I you. mean, me neither. I mean, That's why I'm asking you. <laughs> right. I know. Yeah. And it's a good one. I mean, there is there are I mean, you don't find that kind of language in the Bible. Yeah. And yet we pick it up along the way and, yeah. you know, strong faith and good, you know, better Christian or strong Christian, or I find myself describing people that way. Oh, Stacy, I can't wait for you to meet this guy. He's a strong Christian. I catch myself like, what the hell does that even mean? Compared to yeah. what? <laughs> yeah. 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 Right. Are we comparing ourselves to Jesus or each other? Right. right. And so one of the things that I've often said is um, I that I grew up believing that spiritual maturity, spiritual growth, Christian growth was basically this. I'm getting stronger and stronger and more and more competent every day. When the Bible describes spiritual growth, rather than it describing an upward growth, it describes a downward growth. And what you discover is that real spiritual growth, biblically speaking, is not 
I'm getting stronger and stronger and more and more competent every day. It's I'm becoming increasingly aware of how weak and incompetent I am and how strong and competent Jesus is. The outward man is perishing, but the inward man is being renewed day by day. Yeah, and I just think I just think transformation language is dangerous inside yeah, the church. You're right. I mean, I'm. It's not that transformation doesn't happen. It yeah. does happen, and thank God it happens. I can talk about my own life and how God has transformed me just in the past five years in some ways that have been remarkable and very liberating and all of those things. So I'm not downplaying transformation. I just yeah. think that substitution is the root of Christianity. I mean, you're describing a transformation right now in your life. That's like, right. You're going through transformation. Yeah, that's right. So you're not exempt. No, anybody listens to this goes, I told you he's an antinomian. He doesn't believe in transformation. That's not <laughs> what I'm saying. Okay. Yeah, I'm yeah. not saying transformation. It does not happen in the life of the Christian, but it's, um, but substitution is the focus and the foundation of Christianity, not transformation. Amen. So here, here's my selfish question. And I'm sorry, finish your thought. I'm, I'm very selfish. I'm more selfish than mad. <laughs> but I, but, as, but the other thing I would say real quick is that I, um, I think it's really important to also talk about uh, what, what are good works mm -hmm. and more specifically, who are they for? Yeah. Because mm -hmm. I grew up believing that God's disposition toward me was riding on my behavior or my good works. When I was good, God loved me more. When I was bad, God loved me less. But contrary to what I was taught growing up, our works are not things we must do to keep God's favor. The yeah. life, all of the life instructions we get in the Bible are not given so that we can keep God's love. They are descriptions and directions on how to love others. So you could put it, you know, I think, uh, you know, the, the famous way to put it is God doesn't need our good works, but our neighbor does. Martin Luther. Yes. Yeah. So when we imply that our works are for God and not our neighbor, we perpetuate this idea that God's love and acceptance of us is dependent on what we do rather than on what Jesus has it's done. Like, it's like separation of church and state right there, man. It's like, it's like you're saying, I know what the higher authority is and that's a done deal. But as far as like, like Augustine wrote about the city of God, you know, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of man. As far as the kingdom of man is concerned, they need my good works. Yes. And, yes. And, the so kingdom of my, God doesn't. Right. No, yeah. no, it doesn't. So my selfish well, question. Well, let me, let me, well, real quick, before you, before you go there, let me just, let me I just say this. Selfish, that, this is, bro. I know. I know. Me too. I, I, my selfishness, my selfishness is going to trump your selfishness. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm um, staying in the episode. <laughs> please. Yeah. Well, it's real life. So, um, so I think it's important, really important for people to understand, because this was a massive paradigm shift for me, that mm -hmm. our work are not a transaction with God, they are for others. Because yeah. Jesus has fully and finally fixed things between us and God, and this is super important. Mm. Life after justification doesn't eliminate good works, it just horizontalizes them. Yeah. 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 So now it's not about doing the law in order to in, in, in order to ensure God's love. Yeah. Yeah. Doing the, the law is a description of how can we properly love others? So when, when Paul gives yeah. us a list of the works of the flesh, he's not saying, uh, he, he's saying, listen, the reason I'm, God's telling you not to do this stuff is because when you do this stuff, it's not that you're blocking God's love for you. It's that you are blocking your love for others. Mm. So what is lust? It's taking, wow. not giving. What yeah. is greed? It's wanting and not giving. I mean, when you look at all of those works of the flesh, they're inherently self-centered. It's all about what can I get for me? And the more you focus on taking and getting, the less you're concerned about giving and loving. So yeah. I just I think that's massive because we preach we, we preach massive. good works as if those things are things we need to do to ensure that God stays happy with us. Yeah, God doesn't need it, but other people do. Yeah, yeah that's it. That's it. That makes that makes a ton of sense, man. Yeah, and if you actually think that God needs it, you're you begin using your neighbor instead of actually loving them. That is, that's good that's stuff. exactly right. Write that yeah, down. That's exactly right. Yeah, <laughs> write that exactly down, right. please. <laughs> So I will. Here's, my, here's, here's my selfish thought, okay? So okay. You know about the whole 
evangelical coalition of the 80s and 90s. And um, my whole thought is we compromise the gospel by moralizing it. Yeah. And we wanted to make it more palliative to a broader audience. And in doing so, we actually obscured the gospel. Now, this is not like the unpardonable sin. And I was talking to Brian earlier and I was like, you know, what I love about Peter is he not only committed heresy before the cross, he committed heresy after the cross. And as an apostle, this dude was preaching a false gospel for like a very short second. And then Paul was like, hey, bro, what's going on here? And he's like, yeah, you're right, Paul. I agree with you. I'm sorry. So I feel like culturally as Americans, we've been sold a bill of goods because I can't tell you growing up in the 80s and 90s, it's like, how many times do I got to get saved? How many altar calls do I got to go to? When am I finally going to be in? And I'm like, <laughs> why did this like peripherate the church like where the gospel message was like so diluted and that's what i love about you i i, I don't know you as well as, as matt and brian do i mean i know you from a distance but it's yeah. like you you found out a way to distill the gospel like gospel mm. moonshine just mm. like this is the essence <laughs> of, of of what god is is saying and um, so I was wondering if you could speak to that. Do you agree with what I said? Do you disagree? Like, why are we so confused, not just as Christians, but as Americans? Mm. Like, yeah, well, I mean, let me let me begin to answer that by saying this. Um, <clears throat> how do I say this without being too controversial? Um, let's see. So <clears throat> oftentimes the preachers that at least probably some of you guys and I sort of grew up maybe admiring, looking up to, especially in sort of the Presbyterian reform world. Um, you know, there, there were, there have been a lot of voices, uh, talking against worldliness inside the church. Yeah. And a lot of people talking about the need for the church to be countercultural and to go against the worldly system, which I completely agree. The irony is that the message that these guys all too often deliver is incredibly worldly because countercultural preaching is preaching an it is finished message in a just do it world. That's what countercultural preaching is. And so if you are moralizing Christianity and you're making it, I mean, you could name some really well-known people who do this every time they write or speak, that the focus of the Christian faith is the life of the Christian. And it's all about proving you're a Christian, living like a Christian, being more serious as a Christian. It's all do more, try harder. And the irony is some of these guys, okay, and I'm not going to mention any names, but some of these guys, if they were to hear me say that they are essentially preaching the same message as someone like Joel Osteen, they would vomit. And yet it's, <laughs> and yet it's true. Yeah, They're yeah, both. Yeah. Okay. I mean, these health, wealth, prosperity preachers that these guys rail against, these guys, the, the health, wealth, prosperity people are saying, do more, try harder, get better, have more faith. These other guys are saying the same thing. Yeah, do more, yeah. try harder, get better, have more faith. You know, the health, wealth, prosperity people are saying, do all those things and get blessings from God materially. These yeah, people yeah. are saying, do all these things and get blessings from God spiritually. Yes. Either way, it's still yeah. the same message. It's putting the onus on me to climb a ladder rather than mm -hmm. focusing on Jesus on a cross. And so... Yeah. And him climbing the ladder. <laughs> right. So all, even, those, even those people who... Uh, you know, rail the most against worldliness in the tr in the church and how worldly the church has become. These are the same voices that will stand up Sunday after Sunday and give us a checklist of things yeah. we need to do in order to ensure that we really are a Christian. It's almost like listening to some of these guys. You wonder if they take great pleasure in causing blood-bought Christians to doubt whether they're actually blood-bought. Yeah, I'm no, like, for sure. Man, wow. like, I mean, I don't yeah. know if there's anything worse than causing someone whom God loves to doubt whether or not God loves them. And that would be a worldly church service in heaven. <laughs> That's right. That's right. That's the That's irony. exactly right. That is. <laughs> And so I'm just like, man, where do you, where in the world? I mean, if God doesn't doubt, we had a guy come to our church years ago and he's a well-respected man that I love and have known for years and I admire. And 
I sat there and listened to his message, and I'm telling you, at, for three days after that message, I was, and this is while I was pastor at Coral Ridge, I was driving around in my car, going from place to place, doing whatever I did over the course of those three days, and asking myself, am I really a Christian? Mm, like, yeah. based on what based on what he described, this is causing me to doubt whether or not it really took, you know? Yeah. And I mean, I'm in my late 30s at the time, yeah. and I've been pastoring for years. And I remember it dawned on me. I mm. said, this stuff is toxic, man. Yeah, I mean, if God doesn't doubt my salvation, why in the <laughs> hell is this? Why in the hell is this guy calling me to doubt it? Who yeah. can bring I mean, a charge and, against God's elect, right? Right. That's exactly right, man. That's exactly we, right. Do so we believe when, this stuff or not? <laughs> right. Exactly. And so while, you know, when you were saying, you know, what's happened, I think, you know, I mean, in many ways, I think the... I wrestle too, though. So I'm not without the excuse. So... No, me you know, too. Big time. Yeah. I mean, I, I just think the I just think the message of do... That we can call an American message, which is do more, try harder, is also the church message. And honestly, it is the wow. message of the fallen human condition. Why did we stop preaching the gospel, man? Like, is it is it is it just that? Is it that risky? <laughs> yeah, it is. It, I mean, it 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 confronts the gospel, confronts every conditional fiber in our being, mm. every conditional fiber. So we are conditional mm. people, and we live in a conditional world, and we live mm. amongst conditional people. Conditionality is the way the world works. Unconditionality is the way God works. Well, so, well, he's conditional, but he meets the conditions on our, our behalf. Yeah, there you go. That's yeah. right. That's right. That, yeah, I've often said uh, we're not saved apart from the law. We're saved in Christ who perfectly kept the law for us. Amen. Uh, so, and yeah, what the law thing. cannot do, Christ did. <laughs> that's right. That's <laughs> yep. exactly right. Right. The law condemns. It can't save. Yep. Uh, and Christ saved. So, yeah, I mean, I just, I think that that, I think, um, I think the evangelical church at large, for the most part, and I'm not ranting on even the foundation of evangelical doctrine, the inspiration of scripture. I mean, I, I subscribe to all that stuff. Um, yeah. it's, but the, the evangelical church in terms of its primary messaging, it really is, it can be simplified by saying that in a variety of different ways, what we're hearing and what we're reading and what we're seeing is that the focus of the Christian faith is the life mm. of the Christian. You've been baptized in the gospel, dude. There's there, some like <laughs> trademark that statement because that's some good reformed like, you know, way of saying it. But it's like you have been baptized in the gospel, bro. And I just love that about you because I do not know you as well as these guys know you. And, and they don't well you as know as, as much as they think they do. <laughs> <laughs> Everything that you're like, you're shooting, man. I just, like you said, you got one bullet, man. So thank you. Well, uh, no, you're welcome, man. And it, I, I, I preach it uh, because it's what literally saves me every day. I mean, this is not... <laughs> This is not, this is not, uh, this is, I, I don't, I don't, uh, get off on theological debates about this stuff. That's not yeah. what it's about. It's really, yeah, is a, yeah. it's, it's a functional lifeline for me. I mean, yeah. if this isn't true, if this isn't true, I'm exiting stage left because I have no <laughs> Yeah. No. Right. Like Spurgeon said, he said, while others are congratulating themselves, I have to sit humbly at the cross and marvel that I'm saved at all. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's exactly right. It's exactly yeah. right. Yeah. No, that's well, good. Hey, Tully, and we want to be respectful of your time. It's, <clears throat> we're at an hour. Um, you know, we're, we're just grateful that you're able to come in and talk to us. And I think you just really well uh, did a great job of articulating uh, the, the gospel for our listeners. And, and we're, we sure are grateful for that. And, well, um, well, yes, you guys, thanks, seriously, this is this is a fun. This has been a fun conversation. I had a cup of coffee before we had it, so <laughs> I, I was like, I, I need. I, if the Holy Spirit doesn't show up, caffeine's my backup plan. Yeah, Christian <laughs> crack, man. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's right. Yeah, but no, this has been a really enjoyable conversation. I'm proud of you guys. I'm grateful for what you guys are doing. I'm thoroughly grateful for your commitment to preaching the gospel unedited. It is so necessary and needed out there. Uh, I think one of the things I learned uh, in my wilderness wanderings of being outside of pastoral ministry and disconnected from 
you know, the Christian community at large was that I rubbed shoulders with people who had no idea who I was, and they didn't care, uh, people who had no connection to church or God or anything. And I spent a couple years just listening to these people and, um, and just really paying attention, which is something when you're in professional Christian work, you just don't spend a ton of time with yeah. people that are completely disconnected from God and the church and Christianity. And, and by necessity, I was. And it opened my eyes to so many needs out there and yeah. so much loneliness and so much guilt and so much shame and so much just crap that weighs people down. And I'm like, man, if we sit around and we talk about stuff that no one cares about. Yeah. I mean, no one cares about. Right? I mean, literally, I was, yeah. I was one final story and then we can end. But I was, but we, I was on a, I was at a, sitting on a panel discussion and this was probably seven months after everything blew up. And uh, it was, it, it was, there were still things that were getting ready to blow up, although I didn't know it at the time. And so I'm sitting on this panel discussion and there were, you know, five or six people and we were having a discussion about things that I have sat on panel discussions and discussed 10,000 times, justification, sanctification, law, gospel, all of that stuff, hmm. all the theological stuff that I love. And I was in a really bad place. I mean, just not, I'm not bad morally, just bad emotionally, uh, bad mentally, bad spiritually. I mean, I, had, I my whole life had come off the rails and I was still reeling from all of that and experiencing the consequences of all of that. And, and it was the first time that I had sat on a panel discussion discussing these things and I wanted to scream in front of the audience <laughs> and all of the other people on the panel like, who cares about this? <laughs> Like, literally, tell me something that is going to enable me to not want to kill myself tomorrow. Because every morning I wake up, I want to take my own life, literally. And I'm yeah. like, what? Let's, let's talk about stuff that will give real, like, we're just mm. debating this stuff and picking on this guy and picking on that guy who doesn't say what we say. And we're more articulate and blah, blah, blah. And I'm just like, my God, this is so old. No one cares. Let's no, come out of the ivory towers and meet right. people. Right. Gosh. Yeah. I mean, so. You're not saying I, the I, message I, doesn't matter. You're just saying people matter. Like, yeah. the message well, yes, is for I mean, people. And, and we're just the, talking the, about the details of the message. Like, Right. And it's, yeah. it's, it's the same with the Sabbath. Sabbath, uh, you know, man was not made for the Sabbath. Sabbath was made for the man. And yep. it's the oh, same wow. thing when it comes to a That's theology good. of the gospel. It's yeah. like, this isn't, this wasn't made, I mean, this was made to serve humans in yeah. their struggle and yeah. in the yeah. messiness of actual life. The Son this of Man not did not simply, come to be served, but to serve. Right, I mean. and this isn't, this isn't, <laughs> we, we, it's not just for discussion and debate. I mean, yeah. this is yeah. life. Wow, yeah. dude, so. that's dynamite, bro. <laughs> you, you just walk around with sticks of dynamite, and you're just like... <laughs> <laughs> Usually, oftentimes they go off in my hand, which is my problem. <laughs> <laughs> well, Tolly, and we're going to be praying for you and your new church, um, and and getting back to normal as this thing uh, starts to opening up. And I pray that many, many people get to walk through the doors and hear that message and are set free and find sanctuary. Um, I mean, that's ultimately. A, our goal and um as well and and uh we will labor with you in prayer brother and thank you so so much again for coming on thank you guys very much this was a lot of fun i look forward to coming back <laughs> awesome yeah grace nope. and you, brother thanks man you guys too we'll talk soon wow guys what an awesome episode uh grateful to have tully in on the show with us today Hey, if this is uh, your first time listening to us, I want to encourage you, please go check us out on iTunes or SoundCloud or wherever podcasts are served up. Uh, hit the subscribe button. Please leave us a, a review if you'd be so kind to do that. That really helps us get the show out to more people, gets the gospel, the unadulterated gospel out to as many people as we possibly can. And and by the way, we'd love for you to join our community on Facebook. We have a great little uh, Facebook group that uh, you can join and, uh, and, and, and be a part of the conversation. And, uh, and by the way, we have a brand new website where we're going to be posting blog articles and uh, links to the different uh, episodes that you can share with your friends. Uh, so guys, thanks again for joining us. 
Uh, Until next time, remember, Jesus plus nothing is everything. Peace. Try to catch me howling at the moon. We were joking before the show how, like, when we were all kids, you know, there's two iconic figures, John Rambo and Billy Graham. (laughs) And then in, like, a secret government lab, they... They, 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 they created, created Tullian. Project <laughs> Tolian Chavichia. Let me tell you something. That is the greatest compliment I've ever received in my life. <laughs> ever. Dude, Love John it. Rambo. I mean, Rambo was my hero growing up, man. Right? I mean, my hero. <laughs> I so was more that is a massive the, compliment. When I found out that Santa wasn't real, that didn't bother me as much as when I found out John Rambo wasn't real. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my god. <laughs>